I've got to say, uh, last night I was super encouraged to be down here. My wife and I are from Nebraska originally, so we, <laughs> we are excited to be back here. We have a special place in our heart for the Panhandle. Um, having moved out here, having pastored in the Panhandle, uh, we moved out to Rapid City recently. Um, if we planted roots here forever, uh, our hearts would be happy with joy. It's one thing to love the, uh, the area, the panhandle. <clears throat> it's totally different uh, to have a greater love for the people of the panhandle. Um, just some of the greatest, you guys are some of the greatest folks that we've ever had the pleasure to know. Um, God would have to audibly, with neon lights as well, make it clear if he wanted us to go to different parts of the world because we, we love this right here. Um, <clears throat> I want to be able to introduce my wife, Kate. I would just like to say, if you were one of the ladies involved with putting together the gift basket for Kevin and I, thank you. You are a blessing. I pray blessings back on you, and, and I love my Scooters gift card. Thank you. She pulled that out last night, and it was like, they loved me. <laughs> and I pulled out a fishing lure, and I was like, they love me. <laughs> so we're excited to be here. Um, I, I want to be able to comment on, uh, I've been watching and listening uh, to services online from the past several weeks. I have so enjoyed the messages. They're some of the most healthy messages in terms of how God has called the body of believers to be healthy. Jim, thank you so much uh, for going there and being willing. Can you guys give your pastor a hand? <laughs> All too often today when we're talking about gifts and we're talking about the Holy Spirit and we're talking about healthy ministry and we're talking about how God calls everybody to be a player on the field, um, sometimes that's lost in the church these days. And all too easily, people will look and go, oh, it's the pastor, it's the leader. But really, <clears throat> I love what Pastor Jim was talking about in terms of players. We're all called to be players on the field. We're all called to be a part of ministry. And there are times where God calls coaches that will coach, but they're not called so that they can be celebrated because of a title or be up on stage. Instead, I, I'd almost turn it around. Jesus shouldered the sins of the world on him. Jesus shouldered on himself. He is the chief cornerstone in which all ministry comes off of. And so when you look at a leader, whether it's an apostle, a prophet, uh, evangelist, pastor, teacher, every one of those, if, if they stop and pause, they exist to equip the body of Christ so that we can walk in the fullness of maturity. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 I want to give a quick overview of uh, prophetic for today. And so it'll be one of the few times that I'll probably use the word prophetic because we'll use a different phrase a little bit later here. But sometimes God decides that he wants to reveal things to the body of Christ so that we can know, we can have peace, we can have his trust, his confidence to walk through seasons in this world, even when we turn on the television and television looks like doom and gloom and woe is the world and we're headed towards World War III and we're going to scare the crud out of you because that gets even more ratings. And can I just stop and say, we're going into times and the word has been used often, we're going into unprecedented times. But many things have happened throughout the course of history that were unprecedented to the people that walked planet Earth. But God never intended us to walk into seasons and to be caught unaware by the things that are coming. He never intended us to be the tail. Instead, he called us to be the head. He called us to be ahead of things. And so this last season that we walked into... Um, we went into a season where uh, in 2019, 
things changed in our world. We started beginning to walk into a pandemic stage. 2020, everybody wants to do a do-over on that year almost. <laughs> but in 2018, there, there were individuals in the body of Christ who had revelation to what was coming. And rather than having a spirit of fear, because God hasn't called us to a spirit of fear or timidity, God gave revelation so that we would be ready and prepared for what was coming. The question was posed in prophetic meetings, what's going to happen when the church closes down? That was a question that I had posed even in a meeting with individuals that operate in the prophetic. The, that was a, a statement that was made to, to pastors. And you know what the response was? Well, that's crazy. How's that going to happen? And then if you ended up talking with individuals, there may have been a, a well, and I had people message from around the country, and they're asking questions, and they're like, is this, is this the prelude to the last days? Is Jesus coming? Is this the end times that we're walking into? And can I just stop? Whether it's the news that you're seeing right now going on around the world, or it's everything that we're coming out of in this last season, can I inspire every one of you this morning and say, I'm not here for doom and gloom. I'm not here to share a message like that. My wife and I are not here. We're here to encourage because going into this, this whole season, it wasn't a season of worry. It's a season of hope. God's about to do, and he is at work right now, releasing his righteous hand of judgment on some evil that has walked the planet for many, many years, gone, and it's gone unchecked. He's going to deal, and he is addressing in, in very peculiar ways some of the evil that is on planet Earth. And soon, that evil is going to be exposed for all of us to know. And it, in the end, it's going to bring about one of the greatest awakenings for mankind in our generation. I believe that's one of the precursors to Jesus returning, not just persecution for believers. There's a time where some of that will come, but I believe we're walking into a time where God is going to bring an awakening for mankind across the globe. And he's going to make it really, really clear, and he's going to say, this is good, this is evil. The scripture is really clear um, that God reveals things in advance so that we are not taken by surprise. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, it talks about the tribe of Issachar. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. There's a lot of times when individuals look at this passage and say, hey, this is a reference to the prophetic. It's a reference to those who get revelation. It's a reference to those who end up seeing or sensing what's on God's heart. And a lot of times, they'll be good with that first part of the verse. So could you read that first part of the verse again? I'll, I'll do it. The sons of Issachar, they discern the times. Stop. A lot of people will stop right there, and they don't read the, the next part of it. And it's one of the most powerful things in that whole passage. And it's, they knew what Israel was to do. Church, it's one thing to discern the times. It's one thing to discern the things that are going on in our world and to recognize seasons, but it's another thing to go one more step. And maybe it's even a baby step, but it's to ask the question, God, what are we to do? What is the church to do in response to the times? God wants his people to be prepared for good works. God wants his people and his church today to discern and to know things. Because when we have a steadiness of knowing, if you knew that all of the things that are going on in the world six months from now are not going to end in a World War III, would you have more peace about that? I would. If you knew that the things that are going on in this world were going to lead to 
um, revival in the church. Millions and millions of people coming to Christ, that saving knowledge, that saving grace of God's love, his passion for individuals, and the ability to connect with God on a personal level, if you knew that was going to come out of a time that looks very doom and gloom on the television right now, would it give you more peace? Would it give you more excitement? Because I believe that's what God is trying to speak into this season, that the things that we see happening are, are not as they appear. It's kind of like the small little warning on a, a mirror on your vehicle. Objects may not look or may not appear to be as they are in person. God uses the prophetic to cultivate hope. God uses the prophetic and hearing his voice to draw us to a place of peace, a place of joy, a place of uh, a sense that God is in control. Jesus, as his ministry was coming towards the waning end of, of his ministry, life on earth here, he left us with a promise, and it's in uh, John fourteen twenty seven. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Was that verse 26 as well? Okay, let's go back one verse. Let's see what that says. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So God is sending an Advocate. He's sending the Holy Spirit to empower each and every one of us. Each. Can you guys say each? Each and every one of us. It's not for a select individual. It's not for a select leader. It's not for special people. It's each and every one of us if we have that personal relationship with God. So read, read verse 27 once more. John 14, 27. You'll probably want to leave your bookmarks there. Okay, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Will you pray with us this morning? Father God, I pray that your peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding and guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, God, that that peace would permeate every heart in this room and every person watching online. Lord, I pray that you would reach out and give us clarity and peace, your peace that comes from the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I love the fact that Terry came up, shared a word this morning, um, because our next point was going to be Matthew 24, verse 8, where... Jesus is asked by his disciples, what is the sign of the times and when is the time, how should we know the time of your coming? And he wants the church to be prepared, so he responds. But when we talk of wars and rumors of war and other things that you see, these are but birth pains, but it doesn't mean the time is yet. We might be seeing things happen in the world. It's not time. The prophetic individual may end up speak to, speaking to the church and say, God has greater works. Can you say greater? God has greater works that he has yet to reveal to mankind and to the church. I appreciate last week we were we were in service, and there is a gentleman, the president of North Central Bible College. It's one of the Assembly of God Bible Colleges. His name's Scott Hagen. And Scott was talking about these unprecedented times. And he said, you know, before, pastors never knew what it was going to take for the whole world to be affected by one singular issue. 
We always thought that it was going to be persecution. We always thought it was going to be something against the church. We didn't see that it would be something that would affect everyone in this particular way. And he said, you know, I never, we never saw churches being shut down until the very, very last days. Instead, it was interesting, churches shut down willingly and voluntarily for a reason. These are but birth pains for things yet to come. God is wanting us to be wise in how we operate, even as the body of believers coming together. These are but precursors. I love that Pastor Jim and Pastor Brooke are teaching the church how to be a healthy church. It's one thing for us to come together on a Sunday and fellowship, honor God, lift each other up. But God's called Jim, Pastor Jim and Pastor Brooke, to coach. And to coach leaders in the days that are coming forward, it's going to be this individual pastoring a home, this individual pastoring a home, this individual pastoring a home, because they are the church. Maybe they're the church in their workplace. Maybe they're the church in their neighborhood. Maybe they're the church wherever it is, but they are the representation of Christ wherever they go. Matthew 13, 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. It's God's desire that we would see him, that we would hear him, that it would be spawned out of relationship with him. I want you to think, if you have come to that knowledge of salvation in Jesus, the forgiveness of your sins, the entering into a relationship with God, can you remember that first time that you made that commitment to follow after him? Do you remember how sweet that was? Do you remember how personal that was? Do you remember how God ministered something to your heart that changed you forever? You were marked with his love and you were marked with a purpose. That's not a one-time thing. That's something that God wants to continue in relationship over and over and over. That was just the beginning of an eternal conversation. God wants us to know his voice and his ways. I love what Paul ended up sharing in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I keep asking that God of our <coughs> I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. How about we change that because that was Paul's heart cry for the church in Ephesus. But what if we turn that around and we make that a prayer for us? Kate, would you pray that over all of us this morning? Mm -hmm. Father God, I just ask that you would give each person here a revelation through your Holy Spirit of wisdom and knowledge and of hope and of love and of peace so that we can know you and your character better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So wait a second. Let's pause. I don't want to speed bump right over that point. Paul is, is praying out. His desire is an inspired word from God. And this is something that God wants for the church. So I want to slow down a second. What were the things that God wants to give as a promise to the church? The spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's God being able to show how we operate, how we respond to things, how we carry ourselves. Sometimes, have you ever been in a tough situation and you know that that situation is going to require you to have wisdom on how you carry yourself? And it might be one of those things where you're like, oh my gosh, I got to talk to so-and-so but I've got, God, I need your wisdom on how to do this. Otherwise, this is going to turn out to be a really, really bad conversation. Maybe 
it's a conversation with your spouse. Maybe it happened this morning and you're like, God, I need wisdom on how to talk with my husband or my wife because if I bring this up wrongly, um, I get to get the cold shoulder all of the rest of today. Or sometimes maybe it's more significant than that. This morning, even in, in uh, adult Sunday school, we were talking about wisdom in times when, when you're sharing. And there was a time when I can recall ministering to a person and God was trying to call them out of a lifestyle that they were stuck in. And I got a sense of what the lifestyle was, but how I share that with that person is profoundly important because if I share that wrongly, I can hurt that person. Or if I share it wrongly and I'm off and I'm inaccurate in what I'm sharing, I could hurt that person and it could come across as being incredibly judgmental. And so I asked the Lord, I was like, Lord, give me wisdom on how to share this. And so he cautioned me in my heart and said, be very, very gentle. Ask questions. Be humble that you may not have all of the answers. And so as I proceeded to ask this person about a particular name that wasn't their name, it became clear that the lifestyle that the person was trapped in was being trafficked in an escort service. And God was calling them out of that lifestyle into an identity in Jesus Christ. There is not a greater privilege than to invite somebody out of their, their sinful past into a glorious present with the Lord. But how we do that or how we minister is of great importance because sometimes that makes the difference on how that person is going to respond forever. If I get it wrong or if I come across judgmental, I can get somebody who forever goes like this and shuts off God or shuts off the church. And that's the last thing that God wants to do. So let me ask a question. What's the main reason for hearing God's voice or the revelation of his heart? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Okay, what if I say this instead? What's the main reason God wants to reveal his heart? And oh, by the way, whatever you share as an answer is not wrong. You can't fail this one. You want to try that one? Anyone? Closer with him? Reveal his love? Obedience? Guidance? Anyone else? what he sees or feels about that individual person. Yes, 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 and yes. All correct answers. There's so much that God wants to reveal to us so that we can be mature, complete, transformed. One of the most transforming things I think I could ever ask God myself personally is to know, number one, that he loves me, but number two, I ask this question as, as a young believer in college. I say, God, help me see me with your eyes. And when I started seeing me through his eyes, I started seeing promises he had for me. I started seeing healing in areas of my life that I thought wouldn't be healed. I saw relationships restored in places I didn't think could be restored. I saw promises of him allowing me to participate in his ministry, in his mission here on planet Earth in ways I never thought were possible. And that gave me peace in the moment to be less harsh on myself, to start being less critical, for me to be more surrendered to his love. 
when you get called closer to God because of revelation, it grows you in greater intimacy. It grows you in greater effectiveness. It gives you greater breakthroughs in life. And it causes the church to have a greater impact on this world to reveal his love, his glory, and his power. But learning to hear his voice is a process. Who's this little one here? Hey, can I borrow you for a second? I want, I want to do something. Come here. Come here, kiddo. All right. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to come over here and we're going to play a game. You ready? You ready? So right here, what I want you to do is run as fast as you can and touch that wall over there. You want to do it with me? Okay, ready, set, go. Are you? You ready to race back? Ready, set, go. See if I can you give her a hand? Why is it so easy for us to understand that if we ask a kid to play, the kid will participate? It doesn't take a lot of cajoling and, and arm pulling to get a kid to play. They're just willing to go run and play. And before she ended up running across the, f the floor here, at some point she may have been like this one here, who's a little smaller, learns to walk before they learn to run. But sometimes when it comes to hearing God's voice, there are times where we put pressure on ourselves to go farther and to, to hear better than where we're at. What I love about God is how patient he is to meet us right where we're at to begin that conversation and to grow us in that maturity. There are a lot of gifts in the body of Christ. One of them happens to be prophecy. Prophecy, simply put, is the revelation of God's heart, either spoken, seen, felt, that reveals his heart nature, his desires, or at times forthtelling those things that are yet to come. One of the things that my wife and I have had the pleasure to do is help equip generations that are coming up. We counted a privilege that God trusted us with college and young adults for quite a long time. And in doing that, we decided that we were going to change gears a little bit. So rather than using the word prophecy or prophesying, we ended up changing and, and saying, you know what, we're going, to, we're going to meet them at something that's less intimidating. We're going to use the phrase, hearing the voice of God or sensing God's heart. Does that sound a little less intimidating to you? See, when we, when we talk about spiritual gifts and prophesying, or even things like apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, those titles can sometimes be intimidating to people, especially if God was calling them to step up in those gifts. But a spirit of prophecy is something God desires for the church. Hearing his voice is something that he desires each and every one of us to learn and grow in. Because if we're going to be with him for an eternity, we can start now recognizing his voice. Discerning God's heart for the church today What if we didn't say things like prophecy, 
and we said having a natural relationship with God. So let me ask you, any of you married in here? If you are, raise your hand. Okay. Just going to go and survey just here a little bit. Is it normal for you two to talk to, together with each other? Share your feelings with one another? Kind of know what's on each other's heart? If there was something significant that came up, would you tell your spouse, hey, I need to talk to you about this? Is that normal? Okay. Um, anybody else married here? Husband? Wife? Yeah? Okay. Oh, look, it's married people back here. So let's say you saw something that this would never happen, okay? I'm just going to clarify this would never happen. But let's say Brock was doing something, and, and you didn't like that so much. Would you be able to tell him about it? And then you two work it out? Okay. Sometimes... Sorry for messing with your camera this morning. If we can see that those things are happening in the natural with us, if we're naturally wired to talk, to connect, to relate, to communicate, then why is it that believers can come to a saving faith but wrestle so hard with the thought that God wants to talk with us, that God wants to talk with us regularly. Let's look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. So right there, Paul is telling us to eagerly desire the gift of prophecy. Or let's say it this way, eagerly desire, can you say desire? So God is trying to encourage us that it is okay to have that desire. It's natural that he wired that up inside of us to have that natural desire to hear God's voice. Oh, wait a second. It says prophesy in the Bible. Well, before you can speak, what do you have to do first? Here. You have to be able to hear him before you can speak it out. So to me, that says, well, wait a second. God naturally wants to speak to us. Let's go on to verse 3, Kate. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. How many of you picture... Somebody that is operating in a prophetic gift, and they picture, the first thing that they picture is, oh my gosh, that person is going to come up and they're going to pass a judgment on me. They're going to come up and God's going to put something on their heart and they're going to be like, Pastor Jim, oh goodness, Pastor Jim, you got so many things wrong with you. God's, God's got this list. It's 14 bullet points long of all of the things that God wants to address in your life, of all of the things he doesn't like about Jim and Pastor Jim. That's not how things operate. My kids, our kids recently came home for spring break. I saw my son, he drove back from Lincoln up to Rapid City. He's six foot two, something like that. And I wrap my arms around him. I'm like, buddy, I'm so disappointed in you. I have all of these things against you. Let me start the laundry list. (laughs) No, that's not what I said. Why? Because I have a father's heart. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I wrap him up. And I don't let go. I just let him know how much I love him, how good it is to see him, how proud I am of who he is and who he's becoming. And I got to tell you, I'm not God, the Father. I'm just a natural father with a natural heart. And I'm not perfect. But I can tell you the same Father's heart is communicated, <clears throat> but in a perfect way. The Father's heart was modeled by Jesus when he walked the earth. 
he tried to show us what a relationship with our Heavenly Father looks like. And when Jesus went to the right hand of God, we're left with the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit in us to continue that relationship that we might know God's heart in everything that we do, to be encouraged. That's why God eagerly desires that each one of us knows and hears and senses his heart, that we're, we're able to hear the heart of God. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, 14, 5. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Paul's encouraging there that we would walk with the ability to encourage, to prophesy. Can you imagine if every person that walked through that door this morning, you walk in, you reach your hand down in a bowl, you pull out a person's name, and you're like, oh, very cool. And under it, there's a paragraph. And you're like, I got to find this person. And you walk up to this person, and you go, hmm, Brett. Do you know God has a plan for you? Do you know he, he sees your heart trying to work through things right now? He sees the honesty that you have about some of the ways that you've stumbled. But you keep getting back up. And you keep getting back up. And you keep getting back up. And even though you fall, you keep getting back up. Now, I'm sure that's hypothetical, of course, right, Brett? <laughs> but imagine if each and every one of you came through the door and you pick up a name and a paragraph under the out of the fishbowl, and you're like, I'm going to go up and I'm going to encourage a person today. And everybody in the service, before they left and went through those doors, each and every person had the opportunity to hear something shared with them that was from the heart of the Father to encourage them as they go about their week or their month. Maybe somebody gets a word and they are in one of the toughest spots in their life and they need a breakthrough. And you have the privilege of being able to give that word that gives them breakthrough, that word that gives them hope, that word that helps sustain them in a time of struggle or trial. I believe that's what God wants to release on the church. I believe the Corinthians were eager for that. Now, were they messy? Was the church in Corinth a little bit messy with some of their stuff? Yes. Can I just say that's okay because God's big enough to handle our messes? So what they had to learn were some rules that helped them operate in those gifts in a healthy way. I want to touch on um, spiritual gifts. Kate, would you read 1 Corinthians 14, 19? But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Very good. If we're processing how God wants us to hear from him, the Corinthians were babbling over who could pray in tongues and speak in tongues better than the other person. And Paul kind of puts him, puts him to task on it. And he says, you know, of anyone, I can speak in tongues better than all of you. But let me share these things with you. Rather than competing and speaking in tongues, how about we try this? How about we come up with five understandable words? Simple words that you can communicate to someone that helps them understand what God's heart is in the moment. So it's not confusing to people. Can you put up the list of spiritual gifts? So, thank you, Wikipedia. 
that you have one of the better uh, lists of spiritual gifts, uh, comprehensive lists of spiritual gifts. So I, I want to share with you, I had a friend, I have a friend who operates in the gift of healing, and we had a conversation, and he, he had shared with me a couple years ago, he was like, you know, I know that God allows me to pray for people, and I see them get healed of all sorts of things. He heals their physical body. And I'm like, man, that is an awesome gift. And yet he said something to me. He was like, um, I wish that I could prophesy like other people can prophesy. I wish I could hear God's voice like other people can hear God's voice. And so I paused there for a moment, and I said, well, wait a second. Let me ask this question. If you're in Walmart or you're minding your own business, how do you know to walk up to that person out of all of the, the interesting people that frequent Walmart? And he goes, well, God just puts that person on my heart, and then I get a sense of what body part I'm supposed to pray for, and then I go up and I ask him, hey, can I pray for you? And I was like, oh, so it sounds like God speaks to you. And he goes, yeah, but that's not the same as people who get a prophetic word. And I was like, okay, who shows you what to go pray for? And he goes, the Holy Spirit. I was like, oh, the same spirit that inspires prophecy? The same spirit that, imp that inspires evangelism? The same spirit that's going to inspire somebody serving in the church when nobody is looking and listening and watching and seeing them? See, the same spirit desires to speak, engage with us, and show us opportunities that we have to serve in ministry, in the body, and in the kingdom. It's the same spirit. So how many of you in here, and I asked this question last night, how many of you in here tend to be more outgoing, talkative, and expressive when you're around people? Show of hands. How many of you are more extroverted? Okay. All right, hands down. How many of you in here would say, hey, you know what? I'm a little bit more reserved. When I'm around a lot of people, I don't like to talk much. Can I share something with you? The Holy Spirit is equal opportunity to extroverts and introverts. And the same Holy Spirit can empower every one of those gifts. Let me just share something with you. Did you know that introverted people can sometimes be the, some of the best counselors in the world. You know why? They don't talk over somebody else. They have this gift of listening and being quiet and going, really, tell me more. And sometimes they know how to ask the right question that unlocks something inside a person to where they open up and they start walking into a place of healing. I think there are times where we celebrate individuals that have a more outgoing gift. A lot of times, if you ask percentage of pastors, are you introverted or are you extroverted? There's a lot of extroverts that become pastors. But that's not a bad thing, because do you want a pastor that's introverted and greets no one on a Sunday? Do you want a pastor that's like, and now the reading of the word. <laughs> I'm not going to engage you. I'm not going to have any personality. No, you probably don't want that. You know, fortunately, my wife and I are high-functioning introverts that are spirit-filled and spirit-led. So we try to convey God's heart and what's, what his message is. Could you imagine? If you look up there, some of you can identify a gift a spiritual gift that God has you growing in. Maybe you just began growing in that gift. Maybe you just became aware of what that gift was. And maybe some of you have been walking in that gift so long that you're mature in it. Could you imagine if every person in this room showed up and the Holy Spirit spoke to you in your ear and coached you how to do every one of those gifts to the fullest of your ability. Could you imagine what this church could do? You'd be going in the bomb gars, and they'd be like, oh, that's one of those people from that church. 
Because you'd be like, can I just encourage you? Can I, can I share God's love with you? Can I? But, but God also asks us to do that naturally. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. We all have our part in the body of Christ to play. If we come through that door and we say our part in the body of Christ is just to show up on Sunday, if it's just to sing a song and leave, we're missing it. God has a glorious calling on each and every person to have a relationship with him that is him coming out through our lives in some sort of way that impacts the world and that shows the world his love, his grace, and his mercy. We can all hear God's voice. You don't have to be a prophet. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher to hear God's voice. Hearing God's voice is meant to be a natural function of relationship. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Oh, got that. If we look at all of the other spiritual gifts... The only way that we get to the place where we know how to operate in health in the body of Christ is to be directed. So let me ask you, how do we get there? Well, Pastor Jim hit on that last week already. You get around coaches. I got to say, for me, growing in the gift of, of hearing God's voice, I was blessed. I had people that came around that I could watch, and they coached me on healthy things. They coached me on healthy boundaries. They coached me on humility. They coached me on guarding my heart. They coached me on how I share with people. They coached me on even simple things like my tone, my temperament. God desires a process of hearing his voice and knowing his heart so that we can be natural about it. Hebrews 5.14 but solid food is for the mature, and constant use have trained, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Constant use. Can I give you another word for constant use? Practice. Can you say practice? Practice. Uh, I work in orthopedics right now. We practice medicine every day. Do we get it right 100% of the time? Nope. That's why they call it practicing medicine. But we hope that we're getting better all the time with practice. When you go into the doctor and they're going to do a surgery on your hip, would you like them to be mature about their abilities or do you want to find out that's the first surgery that they've ever done on a person? You would like that they would be mature and they've got some repetitions before they're working on your body, right? The same thing applies in terms of individuals and hearing God's voice. One of the things that we can do in the body of Christ is come up with safe environments for people to grow in those gifts. I love this morning that Terry came up and shared and others came up and shared this morning because those are opportunities to grow in a safe place with good coaches that are going to be able to see them and build relationship over the long term so that they can get better and better and more accurate about how they share, what they share, but it takes practice. How will God speak to us? He speaks in his word. He speaks to us through impressions or pictures. He'll speak to us in dreams. Who's ever looked at that verse in Joel chapter 2 where it talks about dreams and visions? Kate? And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. I must be getting old because I'm having more dreams than seeing visions. That's God's desire. The, the closer we get to seeing Christ return, shouldn't we be expectant that we're going to see God move, his Holy Spirit move to reveal his glory, his power, his majesty, and his purposes and plans for the church in greater ways? I believe so. Why is it important to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand? Answer? Because it was important to Jesus. Did you know Jesus used that phrase 
to have eyes to see and ears to hear more than 15 times. He wants us to have that revelation. He wants us to have that clarity. Wherever you're at in this process of learning to hear God's voice, God is excited to meet you there. He wants to reveal himself in greater ways, and God's patient with us. Um, it, when I came over here to do the little run, it's Miranda? Mira. Mira, sorry. So if I came over here to run, and Mira ran about this far, and then she stopped, and I was like, oh, no, let's keep going. I'd encourage her. But if this is as far as she wanted to go, would I sit there and go, Tisk, tisk, Mira. I can't believe you stopped right in the middle. That's where we're supposed to go. And unfortunately, I think some people have a sense that either God looks at us like that, God's going to judge us when we hit our limits of how far we're comfortable to go with certain things, or even prophetic people will be harsh with us if we're only comfortable to step out and do like little baby steps. Anybody ever see the movie, What About Bob? Baby steps. He was afraid of everything in life. Baby steps. Baby steps. Shared last night, if all the farther you can go in testing these things is going an inch, God is not going to sit on the throne and look down and go, really, Kevin? That's the most you can give me right now? If, if all the farther that I can go in my faith is to take a, a, a step an inch, I have the confidence, I have a father that doesn't stay on the throne, that he runs. He's going to wrap his arms around us. He's going to encourage us right where we're at to go farther. And there are days where we need that feedback. Can I tell you, this was a challenging week coming down here. I needed that feedback. And some of my friends would be like, well, geez, Kevin, you, you can hear from God. Why would you need that feedback? Because I have my limits. I have my areas where I'm still growing. I still have my outer boundary where I have to take those steps of faith when it's not comfortable and it's not easy. But here's what I want to take away from that today. Wherever you are at in that process, God meets us there. Can you say God meets us? And he's patient with us. So how do we grow? Number one, we believe and exercise faith. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. I, got te I tested this process. So I need to, if I'm going to ask God to speak to me, I have to believe that he's going to speak to me. So I did something kind of crazy one time. We were doing youth ministry. We were going to be going to a conference. And so I had looked on the calendar, and I went back 40 days from when the conference was going to start. And I was like, you know what? Hey, Kate, I'm going to do a 40-day fast for the first time in my life. Better you than me. <laughs> so I do this 40-day fast. And so I had been hearing God's voice leading up to the very beginning day of that fast. And then the second I started that fast, it was crickets. I heard nothing. And at first I panicked and I'm like, oh, this is messed up. So I prayed about it and I talked to a friend and I was like, I was like, I don't know what to do. And they're like, well, do you have questions? Or are there things on your heart that you want to process? I was like, yes. And they were like, write those questions down, journal them. And so I was like, I got a lot of questions. So I started writing all of these questions. I think I probably hit easily over 20 to 30 questions on that page by the time I hit the end of that 40-day period. During that 40-day period, heard nothing. I get to the conference, my wife and I, we were like, you know what? They have this thing where you could sign up and somebody would minister to you personally. And if God gave them a word, they'd share it with you. So my wife and I walk in, and we just get into this room, and this lady across the room, 
points her finger at me, and I was like, the door's right behind me. I can leave right now. I was a little bit afraid, but we kept walking, and she came up, and she started speaking what God's heart was for me and my wife. She started speaking, and when she, she got to about her third or fourth sentence, I realized, oh my gosh, these are the questions I had during that 40 days. God was answering them one by one by one by one. He is faithful to hear. He is faithful to speak. But sometimes it's not in when we want him to speak. Sometimes it's not how we want him to speak. Sometimes it's not what we want him to speak. But he does speak. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. that passage Jesus is talking about his sheep recognizing his voice we talked about it last night a little bit in the workshop when Jesus referenced the sheep and the master the master walks and the sheep hear his voice it's not they might hear his voice they might recognize his voice the sheep do hear his voice they do recognize his voice they move with him why because they feel safe there's security there's protection there's wholeness if they continue moving. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Sometimes when you're at the point of your, gr right at the cusp of some of your greatest breakthroughs in your faith, should we be surprised if the enemy comes up and wants to steal that away from us? Should we be surprised that the enemy would come and try to offer a different voice? How do we discern whose voice is whose? Right here is number one. Does it line up with God and his word? Number two, does it line up with God's character? Number three, when you hear the word, does it produce inside of you a peace or an uneasiness? Does it produce in, in you a confidence to move out in things or this and to close up and show up? Those are ways that we can start discerning those voices. But every time that we run into those things, every time the enemy tries to come up with a word that is counter to God, I don't look at that as a negative. I look at that as an opportunity. Have you ever had that moment where you have you feel like the enemy's trying to say something to you and get you to bite on something, and it's like, you're a horrible person. You know what I can do? Well, that's interesting, enemy. You say that I'm a horrible person. In here it says I'm the redeemed. You say that I'm, I'm so far away from God that I can't be helped. And yet I read in here that Jesus is the great redeemer that he draws us near. I look at every opportunity that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy as an opportunity for God and God's people to proclaim life and life more abundantly for each and every one of us. Will you pray with us? Father God, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would release a spirit of prophecy over this house. God, that you would release a spirit of prophecy over people. God, that you would release the ability for us to hear you like a father talking with a son on a couch. Like a father talking with a daughter saying, I love you. I have plans for you. 
I have purposes for you. Don't despair. God, I ask that this would be a, a huge antenna for a region in the days to come. That the people here would be so in tune with you that they would be proclaiming the goodness of you and the goodness of how you move and plan to move on planet Earth in these days to come. God, I pray anointing and protection over Pastor Brooke and Pastor Jim. I pray that you continue to increase their wisdom, their impact. And God, I pray that in the years of ministry for them, God, that they would see an exponential increase in the ability to reproduce pastors, leaders, mentors, coaches. Father, we pray all of these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.